Thank you very much. Chair recognizes the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was having technical difficulties on muting myself, and some of you probably would wish that I would stay muted. But uh, I, uh, I, I appreciate Mr. Greenblatt. Right off the bat, I, I got to tell you, I, I, your passion is exactly what that what your organization needs. And I've worked with groups um, all my years as a prosecutor because of the anti-Semitic violence. And I, I just want to make a quick observation that um, everything you said, I, I agree with, and, every, and what the, the testimony of the chairman elicited from you, I agree with, and. Uh, uh, um, I also think one of the components that we have in this country now is absolutely irresponsible rhetoric from leaders in political and politics and leaders in communities and even people such as uh, celebrities like we've not seen in the last couple of days. I think all that helps contribute to this uh, ignorance and misinformation, which then fuels bad acts. So. I think it's incumbent upon us to have that holistic discussion at some point as well, you know? But I do applaud what you're doing. And the only thing I can tell you is keep going because when I was a prosecutor back in Syracuse, we, my, one of my best friends I went to law school with uh, of Jewish heritage um, uh, was inspired to get involved in law enforcement because of a, uh, a firebombing of a mosque, I mean a mosque, excuse me, a temple in Syracuse. And uh, so it, it's, a, it's a long problem, but my biggest concern is it's on the rise. and Everything you said, we got to think about, but we've got to really hammer people when they engage in irresponsible rhetoric because I think it's really important. I, I, I would just respond, uh, Mr. Kako, Mr. Congressman, by saying, number one, how much we appreciate your service, your work as a prosecutor in upstate New York, and your service in Congress. And I regret that you're retiring because you've been such an important moral voice in so many ways. I'll also thank you for the, for the kind words Look, I mean, we have to be passionate. I, I once had a social media executive say to me, why are you so emotional about this issue? And my response was, why are you not more emotional exactly. about this issue? Like, the, and w I just need to clarify something that my very good friend Nick said just a moment before me. And I want all of you to hear this. There is a clear causal relationship. And I could show you the screenshots where we've seen white supremacist groups, you know, radical Islamist groups organizing on these platforms, whether it's in public places like Facebook groups or private services like Telegram and Signal, or even in the dark web making threats, and then it turns into real world violence. I could tell you about how the shooter in Pittsburgh posted a manifesto and he was communicating on, I think it was Gab or Discord, and said, I'm going in, and then he shot and killed 11 people in a synagogue, or the manifesto that the guy in Poway posted. So this is real. And Mr. Chairman and, and, and Congressman Katko, please do not let the social media companies tell you they just can't get their arms around this. These are the most profitable, most innovative, most technologically capable companies in the United States or the world. Like Facebook has built the most sophisticated advertising platform in the history of capitalism. It's hard to build a business that generates $100 billion a year. You know what's not so hard? knocking off the Nazis. So it like, it literally is treating us like dummies to say that they don't have the means to deal with this. I, I agree with that and thank you very much. And uh, I may be leaving, but you, I, uh, I'm, I'm too much of a loud mouth to shut up the rest of my life. I'll be involved in this <laughs> the rest of my life, that I promise you. Uh, Mr. Rojo, I wanted to uh, speak with you for a moment. I appreciate your testimony as well. And I, I'm vitally concerned about Afghanistan and the vacuum that's been no. left there. So from uh, from an in, uh, from the intel uh, surveillance and reconnaissance standpoint, um, uh, have there been significant shortfalls since we left Afghanistan? And um, talk about that, and talk about the over the horizon, uh, which I think is a, a fa uh, you know failure uh, to admit the, the lack of an intel. And you know, what's going on with respect to Afghanistan? What does it mean for the homeland? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. It's a it's a pertinent question. It's one of the most important questions uh, to, to be asked here today when on the international aspect, the jihadist aspect of this. Uh, in mid-December, General McKenzie was quoted as saying that U.S. capabilities, ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance capabilities inside Afghanistan was reduced to one to two percent of its previous capabilities when the U.S. was in country. Keep in mind that when the military says something like this, they're giving the, the most op optimistic uh, perspective on this. 
So what we're talking about here is that ISR capabilities have been reduced to nearly zero. So that what that means in, in layman's terms is we can't find and observe terrorists who are operating in not just in Afghanistan. This also applies to Pakistan as well. Um, keep in mind the raid to kill Osama bin Laden was launched from Afghanistan. Intelligence was gathered. It was um, intelligence was gathered uh, largely from units that were operating inside of Afghanistan uh, across the border. So th the idea that we can conduct over the horizon strikes and effectively target Al Qaeda and allied groups as well as the Islamic State, which really is a tertiary threat in the region. The Islamic State has been overhyped and Al Qaeda has been um, underrepresented uh, when it comes to the, how the threat is uh, has metastasized in the region. The reason being is that Al Qaeda and the Taliban are in bed together. They're, they are virtually indistinguishable in some regards. Um, and Al Qaeda gives, or the Taliban gives Al Qaeda safe haven. So if we don't have the ability to observe what they're doing, it becomes increasingly difficult to conduct those so-called over the horizon strikes. And the ability to carry out over the horizon strikes, I actually call it over the horizons horizon. We don't have bases in any countries um, to conduct such strikes. The, the stands, the Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan are gonna base the US. I mean, if you're them, why would you base US forces in your country after the U.S. abandoned Afghanistan. Um, Iran obviously isn't going to do it. Pakistan, um, they played that game and they don't want to do this any longer. So the U.S. would have to launch these strikes from carriers or long-range bombers or drones that were flown from out outside. So you have poor intelligence, right, that takes time to gather. Um, you can't keep eyes on your target. And then the platform that you're going to launch your strike from is coming from a long distance. It's a recipe for failure. We saw failure of intelligence in Kabul on August 29th when the U.S. launched that strike against the purported Islamic State planner who wound up being a, a civilian. That's what happened when we were in country. These mistakes happen. Think of the mistakes that can happen when you have, at best, 1% to 2% visibility and the platforms you're using to launch the strikes are far outside the borders of Afghanistan. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Roach. I appreciate it. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your indulgence. Uh, thank you very much.